could never pay any such price as that. So he got an Indian to saw up a load of office wood at one dollar and a half. He made out the usual voucher but signed no name to it, simply appended a note explaining that an Indian had done the work and had done it in a very capable and satisfactory way but could not sign the voucher owing to lack of ability in the necessary direction. The secretary had to pay that dollar and a half. He thought the United States would admire both his economy and his honesty in getting the work done at half price and not putting a pretended Indian signature to the voucher, but the United States did not see it in that light. The United States was too much accustomed to employing dollar and a half thieves in all manner of official capacities to regard his explanation of the voucher as having any foundation in fact. But the next time the Indian sawed wood for us, I taught him to make a cross at the bottom of the voucher. It looked like a cross that had been drunk a year, and then I witnessed it, and it went through all right. The United States never said a word. I was sorry I had not made the voucher for a thousand loads of wood instead of one. The government of my country snubs honest simplicity, but fondles artistic villainy and I think I might have developed into a very capable pickpocket if I had remained in the public service a year or two. That was a fine collection of sovereigns, that first Nevada legislature. They levied taxes to the amount of thirty or forty thousand dollars and ordered expenditures to the extent of about a million. Yet they had their little periodical explosions of economy like all other bodies of the kind. A member proposed to save three dollars a day to the nation by dispensing with the chaplain. And yet that short-sighted man needed the chaplain more than any other member, perhaps, for he generally sat with his feet on his desk, eating raw turnips during the morning prayer. The legislature sat sixty days and passed private toll road franchises all the time. When they adjourned, it was esteemed, estimated that every citizen owned about three franchises, and it was believed that unless Congress gave the territory another degree of longitude, there would but not be enough, there would not be room enough to accommodate the toll roads. The ends of them were hanging over the boundary line everywhere, like a fringe. The fact is, the frightening business had grown to such important proportions that there was nearly as much excitement over suddenly acquired toll road fortunes as over the wonderful silver mines. Chapter 26 The Silver Fever State of the Market Silver Bricks Tales Told Off for the Humboldt Mines By and by I was smitten with the silver fever. Prospecting parties were leaving for the mountains every day and discovering and taking possession of rich silver-bearing loads and ledges of quartz. Plainly, this was the road to fortune. The great gold and curry mine was held at three or four hundred dollars a foot when we arrived, but in two months it had sprung up to eight hundred. The Ophir had been worth only a mere trifle a year gone by, and now it was selling at nearly four thousand dollars a foot. Not a mine could be named that had been that had not experienced an astonishing advance in value within a short time. Everybody was talking about these marvels. Go where you would, you heard nothing else from morning till far into the night. Tom so and so had sold out of the Amanda Smith for forty thousand dollars, hadn't a cent when he took up the ledge six months ago. John Jones had sold half his interest in the Bald Eagle and Mary Ann for eighty for sixty five thousand dollars gold coin and gone to the states for his family the widow brewster had struck it rich in the golden fleece and sold ten feet for eighteen thousand dollars had money enough to buy a crepe bonnet when sing sing tommy killed her husband at baldy johnson's wake last spring the last chance was found had found a clay casing and knew they were right on the ledge. Consequence, feet that went begging yesterday were worth a brick house apiece today, 
and seedy owners who could not get trusted for a drink at any bar in the country yesterday were roaring drunk on champagne today and had hosts of warm personal friends in a town where they had forgotten how to bow or shake hands from long continued want of practice. Johnny Morgan, a common loafer, had gone to sleep in the gutter and waked up worth a hundred thousand dollars in consequence of the decision in the Lady Franklin and Rough and Ready lawsuit, and so on. Day in and day out, the talk pelted our ears, and the excitement waxed hotter and hotter around us. I would have been more or less than human if I had not gone mad like the rest. Cartloads of solid silver bricks as large as pigs of lead were arriving from the mills every day, and such sights as they gave as that gave substance to the wild talk about me. I succumbed and grew as frenzied as the craziest. Every few days news would come of the discovery of a brand new mining region. Immediately the papers would teem with accounts of its richness, and away the surplus population would scamper to take possession. By the time I was fairly inoculated with the disease, Esmeralda had just had a run and Humboldt was beginning to shriek for attention. Humboldt! Humboldt! was the new cry, and straightaway Humboldt, the newest of the new, the richest of the rich, the most marvelous of the marvelous discoveries in Silverland, was occupying two columns of the public prints to Esmeralda's one. I was just on the point of starting to Esmeralda, but turned with the tide and got ready for Humboldt. Then the that the reader may see what moved me and what would as surely have moved him had he been there. I insert here one of the newspaper letters of the day, it and several other letters from the same calm hand were the main means of converting me. I shall not garble the extract, but put it in just as it appeared in the daily territorial enterprise. But what about our minds? I shall be candid with you. I shall express an honest opinion based upon a thorough examination. Humboldt County is the richest mineral region upon God's footstool. Each mountain range is gorged with the precious ores. Humboldt is the true Golconda. The other day an assay of mere croppings yielded exceeding $4,000 to the ton. A week or two ago, an assay of just such surface developments made returns of $7,000 to the ton. Our mountains are full of rambling prospectors. Each day and almost every hour reveals new and more startling evidences of the profuse and intensified wealth of our favored, co favored country, county. The metal is not silver alone. There are distinct ledges of auriferous ore, a late discovery plainly evinces cinnabar. The coarser metals are in gross abundance. Lately evidences of bituminous coal have been detected. My theory has ever been that coal is a ligneous formation. I told Cor Colonel Whitman in times past that the neighborhood of Dayton, Nevada, betrayed no presence or previous manifestations of a ligneous foundation, and that hence I had no confidence in his lauded coal mines. I repeated the same doctrine to the exultant coal discoveries of Humboldt. I talked with my friend Captain Birch on the subject. My franism vanished upon his statement that in the very region referred to he had seen petrified trees of the length of 200 feet, that is the fact established that huge forests once cast their grim shadows over this remote section. I am firm in the coal faith. Have no fears of the mineral resources of Humboldt County. They are immense, incalculable. Let me state one or two things which will help the reader to better comprehend certain items in the above. At this time, our near neighbor, Gold Hill, was the most successful silver mining locality in Nevada. It was from there that more than half the daily shipments of silver bricks came. Very rich and scarce, Gold Hill ore yielded from $100 to $400 to the ton, 
but the usual yield was only 20 to 40 per ton. That is to say, each hundred pounds of ore yielded from one dollar to two dollars. But the reader will perceive by the above extract that in Humboldt, from one-fourth to nearly half the mass was silver. That is to say, every one hundred pounds of the ore had from two hundred dollars up to about three hundred and fifty in it. Some days later, this same correspondent wrote, I have spoken of the vast and almost fabulous wealth of the region, of this region. It is incredible. The intestines of our mountains are gorged with precious ore to plethora. I have said that nature has so shaped our mountains as to furnish most excellent facilities for the working of our mines. I have also told you that the country about here is pregnant with the finest mill sites in the world. But what is the mining history of Humboldt? The Sheba mine is in the hands of energetic San Francisco capitalists. It would seem that the ore is combined with the metals that render it difficult of reduction with our imperfect mountain machinery. The proprietors have combined the capital and labor hinted at in my exordium. They are toiling and probing. Their tunnel has reached the length of 100 feet. From primal assays alone, coupled with the development of the mine and public confidence in the continuance of effort, the stock had reared itself to $800 market value. I do not know that one ton of the, the ore has been converted into current metal. I do know that there are many loads in this section that surpass the 